Um, well, first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Martin Samuels. I work at the Fox Center. I'm the Associate Director of uh, Science and Learning. And I have uh, two of the colleagues who I get to uh, I'm share this session with. But really, the session is, and I'll allow them to introduce themselves, but really, I want to focus the session on an opportunity to hear from the students who are so kind to actually join us today. So we can hear about their experiences of both, uh, how have they received good, uh, dealt with good feedback of teacher evaluation in the class, and what are some examples of uh, that have been more challenging, which they've tried to provide teacher feedback to their uh, class and it either has not worked out well, or hasn't gone according to their plans as a student. And with that, I, um, I'm gonna ask each student to kind of introduce him or herself, and maybe start off with a short Wait, story. Wait, before we do that, can we do this? The flash card thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so before we do start the panel, I'm Johanna Gutlerner. I work at the medical school. I'm a associate dean for planning and administration in grad ed, basic science, and global programs. A lot to say. Um, but we would just ask you to start out by answering this question for us, which Jason, want to read it? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Please write down one question informed by the previous sessions or otherwise, which you'd like to have our panelists address over the course of this session. We'll collect those on the card and integrate them into the discussion in the second half. But if you have something that you'd like to sort of make sure we raise in this session, this is just for attempt to collect that. And if you want to pose a question yourself, just please write your name on the card so we know who to call on. And specifically, like, we're lucky to have our actual stakeholders in learning and teaching here in this session. So, you know, specifically questions that you want to ask our student panelists. So maybe we'll give you a couple minutes to do that and then they can introduce themselves. And, and can we also write down questions as they start talking? Absolutely, okay. yes. There will be lots more opportunity. These ones, we're just we're going to have some pre pre form <laughs> questions. <laughs> All right, so we'll come around and collect those, but maybe now uh, we can ask our student panelists to just introduce themselves, and then um, we had asked that each of them tell about a four or five minute story relevant to today's topic, and then um, after we hear from them, we'll have you guys think a little bit. Um, we may ask you to talk to each other, so if you're at a table with no uh, colleagues, you may want to move uh, somewhere where there's other people to talk to. Um, and then we'll return and ask, um, you know, have a conversation about what we heard. So, Christopher, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, so, I'm uh, Chris Lee. Uh, I'm a senior at Harvard College. Uh, I'm studying uh, human developmental and regenerative biology, which is under the scrub department, uh, stem cell and regenerative biology. And I'm also doing a minor in government. Um, I kind of dabbled around in the different science majors uh, for a little bit, so I actually uh, spent a semester as a uh, chemical and physical biology major, um, but the kind of divisions between the different concentrations are pretty subtle, and so it's easy to kind of move around. Um, one story I thought I would share is about um, a class that, it was a pretty large class that most life sciences students teach here at Harvard, or take here at Harvard, sorry. Um, and. Uh, it, it's one of those classes where everyone has an impression of it before you enter the class. And it's a requirement for all students going through pre-med, going through uh, any biology or kind of chemistry major. Um, and this course had traditionally been taught by Harvard faculty and it was taught by one or two members who rotated kind of back and forth and there was a very defined system of doing things. Um, and the other notable aspect was that it was the second uh, semester to a two semester sequence. and so. I won't name the class, but I think it might be easy to kind of discern what class this was. Um, and so the students in this class were obviously very, uh, you know, grade conscious, very worried about kind of doing well. I mean, most of them were very interested in the material, and it was, uh, I would say, most students are probably certainly invested in actually learning. Um, but it was also an environment where, you know, students were kind of focused on kind of the outcome on their transcript as well. And so this course was the second semester in the sequence, and the first semester in previous years have been kind of done this standard way with a lot of PowerPoints. Um, it was very, uh, I guess, packaged for students, so there was very little, you know, reading textbooks, synthesizing notes, going to office hours, everything was uh, condensed to one sheet of paper, 
given out to you every week. PowerPoint slides were posted. They actually posted annotated slides. There were lecture videos. So everything, you practically didn't even have to go to class or read a textbook and you could kind of get the material. And the problem sets were very straightforward and everything was kind of done in a way that I think was you know, overly generous to the students. Um, so we actually had a professor teach the second semester of the sequence who wasn't a Harvard faculty member. He was a visiting professor. And he kind of decided to do everything completely differently. And so he took a very traditionalist approach, which I think for the subject matter actually is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, everything was done at the chalkboard. Uh, there were no slides. Um, there were no handouts. And he expected you to kind of read the textbook, synthesize things yourself. And there was a huge amount of, I would say, backlash or kind of uh, unhappiness with this form of teaching. Um, he would also cold call, and so, I mean, it was a large lecture class, but you know, he would call the students and ask them to answer questions, regardless of whether or not they were right or wrong, just to get the kind of conversation going. And so, I think what we took out of this was that, I think a couple things. So the first is that students often are very vocal about feedback, but sometimes that feedback may not be directed at the quality of teaching. And so actually, I personally, and there were students in the class who disagreed with a lot of the, the majority voice, which was that this professor had no idea what he was doing. He was doing everything wrong. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Um, he wasn't teaching correctly. Cold calling, according to many of my uh, peers and friends, was a dangerous or unsafe tactic in the classroom. Um, and so there was a lot of kind of just unhappiness with the way he taught the class. Um, it was also markedly more difficult than years before. And so I think that was also another uh, contributing factor. And so I think uh, a lot of students voiced kind of disagreement with this. They went to the preceptor, who's kind of uh, one of the kind of support members of the course who develops most of the curriculum. And um, halfway through the course, actually it was less than halfway, about a third of the way through the course, um, the professor actually decided to stop cold calling, to put a lot of the material on slides. And he, you know, he was a senior faculty, faculty member at another Ivy League school, so he'd been doing this for many, many years at that school. He was on sabbatical. Um, and it just, I think, personally, I felt that that was a, I guess, a misuse, or at least I thought it was a kind of the outcome was not necessarily uh, something positive, because I think his teaching methods forced students to kind of learn in a way that was not necessarily what they had done before, which I think is a good thing. Um, I think he, there was pretty much consensus that he was a good teacher, but the problem was that people thought the course was hard and that his teaching style made it different or forced people to kind of learn in a different way. And so I think one thing that I would say, I guess the conclusion of the story is that oftentimes, especially in places, you know, Harvard, where students are very concerned about the on paper outcome of a course, um, sometimes the feedback, whether it's robust or not, can be directed at kind of student satisfaction with the course rather than the quality of teaching. Mm -hmm. And for you know a bunch of 20-year-olds who are worried about applying to med school and grad school, sometimes it's hard to pull those distinctions apart. Um, but I do think that, that one of the <coughs> advantages or one of the positive outcomes was that there was a very kind of uh, robust conversation about kind of what people thought. And so to the point where the professor decided and made the decision to kind of switch teaching styles. So at least I think that conversation was there and people were aware. Um, whether or not that was a smart choice is a separate question, but I think at least uh, there was that type of dialogue. Oh, that's so rich. We have to do a little Q&A right now. <laughs> we can't just go through all of the panelists. I know I have a lot of questions. Any questions? Thank you, Chris. Any questions for Chris Burning? We'll have more opportunities. So you mentioned that you thought he was a good teacher. So that suggests to me, and I'm trying to understand what that means to you. As a learner, it sounds like though it was harder, you felt like you were learning more and, and with his techniques than you had been with just sort of having it spoon fed. Is right. that correct? Right, yeah. So the previous kind of versions of the course would be where the professor, the instructor, would have slides where there were the um, so this was a biochemistry course, <laughs> where there would be the mechanisms for the chemical reactions and everything would be there, and then the problem sets and exams would just be you know, different molecules, <laughs> different applications. And for him, uh, the, the way he taught it was very much through um, kind of a Socratic method, actually. Um, you know, what happens if we do this? What if we add this here? What if I do this different transformation? Why is, it, why is this working in this way? Why are these mechanisms interacting this way? Um, I thought it actually forced you to understand the intuition, the kind of principles behind what was going on on the chalkboard, which is why I think actually that tool was useful. Yeah. Uh, but I think for a lot of students, it was the rapidity at which he wrote on the board 
um, not having, you know, you had to actually take notes, which, so it was really funny because we have these midterm evaluations and some students, so he actually, so I guess this goes to some of the questions we'll probably talk about later, but he, so at Harvard for most courses, you fill out an on paper evaluation for the instructor about halfway through the course. And so he actually decided to kind of take this in a very adversary, not ad what's the word in, about legal, like kind of Mm -hmm. Not combative, yeah. but yeah. adversarial. Yeah. 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 yeah, and so he actually put that day after the evaluations came out, he had an entire PowerPoint slide deck with quotes from the evaluation, yeah. and he basically would go through and explain why. So there would be criticisms like, "We should not be forced to take notes in this class because it forces," which I think is absolutely ridiculous for <laughs> a student to say. Um, and he would explain why I think it's important for you to take notes. And he actually had, as a scientist, he had evidence and he pulled out publications. He was like, students learn 32% better when they write down things by hand rather than just seeing slides. And so he went through all of these comments and basically defended his decisions. Um, and then the decisions that he decided to change, um, for example, someone with a call, cold calling was a very unhealthy uh, tactic. He, he said, you know, I'll concede that point. I won't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you think his transparency there was persuasive for your colleagues in the class? You know, when he said, uh, this is, you know, I, learning is hard, and you know, you know, I can imagine he may have said that, right? I want you to take notes. You need to generate knowledge on your own. Was that persuasive? Did that bring more of your colleagues along to his style? I think it was. I think it was very important in explaining. I think a lot of students came away from that understanding why he did things the way he did. I don't think it necessarily convinced them or brought them to his side. Um, and I think even at the end of the course, and you know, this is two. This was two years ago, but um, I think it was a very polarizing kind of class in the sense of there were students who absolutely loved him and he has a group of students who stay in touch with him and he comes back to Harvard every semester and we do journal clubs with him and he comes to and so there were students who thought he was one of the best science instructors ever and then there were I'd say the maybe two-thirds of students thought he was a good instructor but the class was something that they absolutely despised because of various you know reasons mm -hmm. um, so I think people understood what he was doing uh, I think he made that clear uh, but I don't think necessarily people all kind of came on board or agreed with him. So maybe we'll take one more question right now for Chris, and then we'll come back at the end. Yeah. Uh, so when they, when they when they change when they the, with the faculty he decided to change his style midway through, was there a discussion among the students about um, what that said about the power of the students in in and how did the students seem to feel about that power if you if that ever came up sure. in the kind of discussion afterwards right um i think people realized so i think for him it was a little bit different because a lot of faculty members they teach consistently and so you know if a course goes poorly one semester then right. that reflects mm -hmm. on next year and down the line mm -hmm. but he was here for one semester and that was it so i don't think i think he had a different type of pressure in terms of having to cater to the pop you know worrying about popularity and what mm -hmm. my Q scores will be like, he was gone after this. Right. Um, I think the power dynamic came more from the preceptor. So the preceptor for this course was someone who was immensely popular with the students. I don't think there's a single student who didn't absolutely love her. And she was a good instructor. Um, she also was part of the first semester of the course. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think students felt very comfortable going to her. She was also a younger faculty member, um, definitely more, you know, able to speak to students about what they were feeling versus, you know, he was a very, he was a little bit more senior, kind of mm -hmm. older, you know, just a little bit in terms of age, farther mm -hmm. removed from college students. And so I think what happened was all of the feedback was channeled through the preceptor, okay. who then I think ultimately there, were, there had to be a conversation between the teaching staff, her and the professor, and they made those decisions. And so I think it was really, I think, so I think maybe that speaks more toward the importance of having different voices on a teaching team as opposed to kind of the traditional, there's one professor and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, especially with large Harvard courses where there are teaching fellows, there's a preceptor, sometimes there's a head teaching fellow. Um, those parts of the system kind of often work together and communicate things to then push a course in a different direction. Thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, Brandon, you want to Introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Brandon. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student uh, in biomedical sciences, currently based over at the Longwood campus. Um, I originally did my undergrad in Toronto before coming here for grad school. Um, and 
While I've been a teaching assistant for some graduate school courses in my program, I thought the most uh, sort of insightful um, sort of vignettes I could share about my experience so far uh, with the, the teacher-student relationship and, and how to evaluate that would really be in the context of uh, working in a professor's lab um, and doing your thesis work um, with a specific supervisor. So the way, the way our program works is um, for the first uh, one to two years, uh, most students finish uh, the required courses and at the end of their first year they select a thesis lab uh, in which to do their, their thesis work and their, and their thesis research. Um, so over the course of my undergraduate and graduate studies I've come to know maybe uh, between five and six uh, professors pr um, on, a, on a scientific and personal level as I've transited through their labs and I've had, a, had an experience to sort of um, feel out how, how different programs and different and different scientists actually like to be given feedback and, and like to, to hear sort of how their mentorship style is working. And I have to say, in the majority of cases, it's been that there's no feedback and there's no evaluation solicited, and you have to be the one to give it forward. So in my undergrad, um, I worked in three different labs, and essentially, uh, the PI or the professor who was supervising the lab uh, would, would not ever ask for any feedback and, and it's sort of it, it's sort of a relationship where you you are a student in their lab and you are studying under them um, but it's sort of a one-way relationship and while the PI may be comfortable with receiving feedback from you you have to be the one to initiate that process and there's no um, there's no formalized uh, method for delivering feedback to a professor um, and when I've come to Harvard I've had a couple of different experiences with this um, so I spent a short time in in a relatively new lab as part of one of my rotations while I was selecting a, a thesis lab to work in. Um, and she actually sat me down at the end of my rotation and, and she asked how I felt about um, her mentorship style and, and how, how she was running the lab. And I, I felt really um, gratified to actually have the chance um, to be asked for my feedback instead of having to actually um, take that step and walk into their office and, and tell them something I've been concerned about. And that actually, I felt, was a really big uh, moment uh, and and really something new that I hadn't experienced before um, and now that I'm in a thesis lab I, I found myself working uh, working with actually a professor who has really he has an extremely open door policy he essentially has just said be frank with me all the time um, and anytime I want to go into him or, or his office with a concern um, I know I know he's there and ready to listen but I also know other students in situations where they aren't comfortable um, giving feedback to their PI. They receive feedback on their work, on, on their work styles, on, on the quality of their data, etc. Uh, from the PI, but it never really goes back the other way. And there's no, aside from sort of going to the administrative office and asking them to really escalate your concerns, there's no uh, formalized and maybe not so serious way of, um, of giving feedback. Because once you sort of start that process, um, it's pretty rigorous for everyone involved and usually doesn't have a good outcome for the, for the relationship of the, of the student and the PI. So I think, I think there's definitely a lot of ground uh, for either discussion or improvement in that area. Um, and as I understand, that was also a topic in the keynote this morning, so. <clears throat> Any burning questions for Brandon? Yeah. So just speaking of the range of the faculty that you had the experience of working with, yeah. was there any observation of a generational difference in absolutely. terms of the people who were willing to take feedback and looking for it and the people who weren't? Um, yes, yes, absolutely. So I would say the ones that have been most receptive to feedback definitely are on the early end of their career or just starting their lab. Um, I wouldn't say that older scientists are less receptive to feedback. I would say it's more difficult to actually just give them feedback um, because they tend to be more established. Um, they tend to be a little more distant. They, maybe they're not in the lab as, uh, as much and it's hard to actually track them down and, and express their concerns. But, but yeah, that definitely seems to track with um, sort of how long you've been in science for. So um, I, I have one other question for you. Um, so you mentioned, you know, this should be done. <laughs> we, we need to solicit uh, feedback from mentees for their mentors. And, you know, so there, 
you could imagine some kind of anonymous survey, but that doesn't really get at the crux of what you're talking about, which is this is a very individual relationship. Right. And while you've heard your PI say, I have an open door, come talk to me, and you've done that, I could imagine for other students in the lab, they might feel less inclined to really be open and honest and say all the things that are on their mind. So I wonder if you have ideas for how we how do you encourage this feedback in the lab setting? You know, what interventions could go in to help, you know, every student and every and their mentor have these more productive feedback conversations? Right. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I'm glad you brought up the point of how to like make things anonymous because in this kind of relationship, I I really don't think you like there's no space to make uh, to remove identifying information because um, a PI will typically have between <coughs> one and I'd say maybe four or five students. So if they're receiving feedback, it's it's not really useful to them if it's anonymous. And I think that having specific information and having and actually educating the PI that perhaps it's not really criticism but more suggestions and improvements for the future um, and changing that mentality is more important than sort of saying oh an anonymous student has said um, x y and z about you um, and so really the only formal process I know right now that where um, students are asked for feedback on on the lab they were in and, and how that how that went is when students are leaving the program or when they've graduated, uh, which may not be the most uh, immediately helpful to, to the program, I think. And one, one, one idea I, I have had is really maybe instituting some sort of, uh, not, not so much formal, but some sort of set meeting uh, with, the, with, the, with the professor and with the student, um, maybe once a semester, even, even once a year would be, um, I think, more than frequent enough, where the explicit goal is not is not for the PI to give feedback on the student, which is typically how, how meetings with the PI and the student go, but instead for it to go the other way. And, and for the explicit goal um, of these meetings to be for the student to express how they've been um, sort of experiencing the lab and how they, how they feel about uh, mentorship styles and, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Um, so yeah. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sinia Mahang. I am a second year at Harvard Law School. Um, I also went to Harvard College for undergrad and studied social studies. Um, so I actually transferred here from GW, so my perspective is a little different. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about with you all is actually something that's happened since I've been here, and less on the end of sort of giving feedback on your teacher's performance or whatnot, or the course so far as it's been, but actually having one of my professors ask at the very beginning of class what our goals and expectations were for the class and using that to form the curriculum for our class. So um, it's actually a visiting professor here who is teaching a class on Black Lives Matter and the law. And for a bunch of us, we're really excited to take this class. It's a smaller class, it's one credit as opposed to, you know, a three or four credit class. And we didn't get the syllabus beforehand, and I think for a bunch of us that was really scary, um, trying to figure out what that meant and how much reading it would be. Um, and when we got into our first day, we had had some background readings given to us, and he actually sat us down, and our class is about 16 people maybe, and he asked us you know, to describe ourselves, to tell us about our experiences and where we're coming from and what motivated us to take the class, um, as well as to sort of say what we wanted to get out of it, what we were hoping for um, out of the readings and out of the discussions, which I tend to be someone who doesn't like, you know, I didn't think about that beforehand as much as I probably should have. Um, but we all went around and sort of engaged in conversation with one another about sort of our backgrounds. And I think for me, that was, a, it was just a great experience to hear not only from our professor and his background, but then hear from our other classmates and understand the perspective they were coming from um, and what they were looking to get out of it and seeing how much that matched up with what I was looking for and sort of seeing that perspective and understanding at, you know, from the very first class that we all have different perspectives, we all have different goals and how do we help each other to reach those. Um, and so for me that, you know, that was a very, you know, welcome to, <laughs> welcome to HLS kind of moment. Um, and I'm really excited to sort of see how the semester goes and 
how our conversations in the smaller group uh, feed into that narrative and um, our, you know, so our syllabus has now been formed so we know what's happening throughout the semester. Um, but it does seem, and even in our conversation within the first meeting of the class, we could tell that he was asking us and trying to pull from our different perspectives and directing questions at certain people who might have certain experiences um, and then directing others at others. Um, so, yeah. Any questions or similar? So, uh, this is, I would love to, to do that myself, is to, to, to leave it open, but I, I wondered, um, w was this sort of invitation uh, covering the material and the kinds of questions, the content, so to speak, or did it also uh, in incorporate how should I evaluate you, um, how do we define whether we've learned anything, uh, was that also open for discussion, or was it really just content? And maybe this is different because you're in law school than from an undergraduate, but you can imagine at the undergraduate level, uh, at some point, some things aren't negotiable or open. So how did it work in that class? So uh, because this is one credit class, it's called a reading group, and it tends to be credit fail, so okay. professors have a very sort of open I guess, experience with that. They can do, pretty much do whatever they want. Um, the conversation definitely was more of, what are you looking for? Less on how he would be evaluating us, but mm -hmm. more on how he structures our reading and the content, making sure that for this, what you know, wasn't necessarily like a, a waste of time class for for us. Um, he wanted it to be sort of specific to what we needed out of it, what we were trying to get out of it. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Disha. Hi everybody, I'm Disha. I am an undergraduate at Harvard College studying chemical and physical biology. I'm a junior. Um, with a secondary in computer science, and I've taken a bunch of classes in the humanities, some in engineering, so I can really speak to a pretty broad, diverse array of what Harvard College has to offer. Um, on campus here, I'm also a course facilitator for Intro to Life Sciences, and I'm a peer advisor for the incoming freshmen, so I've talked to a lot of them about their experiences choosing courses, and I also teach dance and poetry to Cambridge Middle School children, so I understand how hard the teaching side of it is, is as well. Um, so I would just like to start with an anecdote that's a little bit similar to Chris's. It's about um, a large life science course here on campus, um, and my experience with the mid-year evaluation and the students' experience as a whole. Um, so this course is pretty required for a lot of students pursuing both biology and chemistry, but also pre-med. Um, it was taught this year that I was taking it by a new faculty member um, who was young, still establishing himself, still learning the ropes of how to teach at Harvard. Um, and there were mixed reviews of his teaching style early on in the class. Um, there were a lot of people who were wanting to be able to ask more questions during the lecture, which is, considering it's a very large lecture style class, it's pretty difficult to take questions within just the one hour that the professor has for instruction. So that's understandable. Um, but there was a lot of feedback and push during the mid-year evaluation time for him to be able to take more questions, for the lecture slides to be printed on larger papers because we had all these chemical reactions that should probably have been printed on one slide instead of two slides per page, um, for him to hold more frequent office hours. Um, basically, the way he approached this was very upfront. I talked to the preceptor of the course later on, person to person in office hours, and she basically told me that he had gone through and read every single one of the 300 evaluations that every single student had submitted during the mid-year evaluation period. Um, and he took those quite personally sometimes because they were quite hard to read. It was his first year teaching, so there was a lot of pretty candid feedback. Um, but he went through and then personally addressed the entire class in a lecture that actually happened on my birthday, which is around the mid-year time, um, with the feedback that basically he had gotten and said, these are the things that I'm going to do differently. Um, I am going to take more questions during class. The slides are going to be printed in this new format, so it's easier for you guys to handle them and understand them. Um, this is how office hours are going to work now. Basically, he stood there and addressed every single one of our concerns in person. Um, and it was very validating to hear that a professor for this very large class, professor on tenure track who was just getting used to style of teaching at Harvard, was willing to hear what we had to say and was willing to hear the sort of evaluations that we had for him and really took the time to critically read everything that we said. That being said, I do think that echoing something that Chris said earlier, not all of the student evaluations that I believe that courses receive 
are always in the best interest of the students' learning, in a sense. Um, I've also taken a survey class in the humanities that is primarily geared toward freshmen, um, and the course is very challenging. We read uh, Joyce's Ulysses in three weeks, and we read like Plato and uh, Macbeth and all of these books like once per like one book per week, basically. It's a time-intensive, reading-intensive class, and I think my year was the second year that it was being run, and the year afterward it was significantly easier, I believe. Like the workload was easier, the final was easier, and because of that, I think the course actually became less rich for the students who were involved because the faculty had decided to take into account the evaluations that were asking for the class to be less time and less of a stressful burden on the students come finals period. Um, but I really think that I got a lot more out of the course when it was more challenging. So I think, in a sense, students do have the power to shape a lot about how the course works. But like Chris was saying earlier, sometimes we do worry a little bit too much about the time constraint or what it will do to our GPA or the fact that it's just a requirement or a concentration. Um, so I think it's worth having those candid conversations and keeping that in mind with the evaluations. So thanks, Disha. So you mentioned uh, when before today that you really value the Q guy as a student. Mm -hmm. So and yet you just talked about this discrepancy that could exist between sort of the popularity of a professor and maybe even how good he or she, how charismatic he is in front of the classroom, um, with what you actually learn mm -hmm. in the class, and that those two may not always correlate highly. So I wonder what it is from the student side that you value in the queue. What do you look for when you're shopping a course and, and deciding, you know, does this look like something I'm interested in? What, what are you looking for in this other students' feedback? So I think the queue is absolutely something that's pretty critical for a lot of students because, especially freshmen, they don't always have a whole lot of places to learn about what a class is like before they go into shopping week. Um, that being said, I do take the Q guide with a grain of salt sometimes because the sort of evaluations that students give are anonymized and you don't know exactly the background of some students going into the class. Um, like say, for example, I came from a very strong life sciences background in high school. I took an I took organic chemistry in high school and because of that, my experience going into, into organic chemistry in freshman year was very different from some of the things that the Q guide was saying, which was like, oh, this class is awful. It's going to wreck your life. It's going to be way too difficult for you to take as a freshman. Blah, blah, blah. Um, it's, it's just something to keep in mind, and I do think that there are classes that will be rated highly that are, that I think potentially are rated highly just because of the personality of the professor or because of, like, I, for example, there's one particular science class that normally gets pretty high Q scores, but gets that because the professor is really funny. Not necessarily because the class is particularly well taught, it's just because the lectures are enjoyable. Um, when I look at the Q guide as a student, I really value the fact that the Q shows the amount of hours that go into the class per week, um, because as busy students, everyone wants to know how to budget their time on average. Um, and I also really value what the students individually have to say. Um, so I think faculty sometimes get asked, like, is the Q even useful? They wonder whether the students even use it. I do think it's very useful. I think I have not really seen any courses that don't release Q scores, but when they don't, it makes me wonder, like, what is there about the course that I should know? What, what, is, the, what is there that the faculty doesn't want me to see, basically? Um, so, yeah. Questions? <coughs> Questions for, for Disha or any of our panelists? Actually, I have a question, but so, you know, kind of informed by the, the comments that Disha just made. Um, I've never taken a law class, <clears throat> and so I don't know what your standard is for giving um, evaluation feedback. So not thinking just about Harvard and the experience so far, but when you think back about any of the work at GW, how do you actually um, give feedback? Is it just the end of the semester eval? And then how do you know if faculty factor that in or keep them accountable to it? So um, the law school model is typically you give feedback at the end. It's something like a Q guide uh, system where, you know, so for GW, for instance, you would rank the hours, the effectiveness of the lectures, um, you know, teachers' knowledge of the course, um, student engagement and participation, and then you had a box where you could give individual sort of comments and feedbacks either to the teacher and then just students who are considering the class. Um, 
the second, so that tends to be pretty much everywhere. I will say one thing that I was so shocked about Harvard Law is that apparently it's not online. I think they're moving towards that direction, but I will say is choosing classes for the semester was terrible, trying to figure out, you know, what to take, you know, what do I know about these professors? Some of it is, you know, they have some of it online, but ultimately it's just not in, all together in the space that I think it really should be. Um, but basically, trying to, I, I use it a lot. I use that feedback, especially the individual comments at GW based on what students have said about the class. So if they say, you know, if you, so government contracts, if you have a broad interest in this, this person's a person for you, if you want something that's more in depth or specific, or you know that this is something that you want to do, go with a different professor. Um, hearing that feedback and then figuring that out is so helpful. Um, but in terms of teacher, the feedback that teachers get and professors get from those evaluations, we have no idea whether or not they take it into consideration. And I will say something for me as a student, and I think a lot of my other classmates think this as well, is that the tenure system sort of, you know, you write an evaluation, especially for your 1L sort of doctrinal classes, um, where you say, you know, I didn't understand a thing that this professor was saying to me all semester. I went to office hours, he was grouchy and mean and didn't help, and you know, I left the class just feeling like I couldn't do this subject. And then you know that nothing changes because they've said in the past, whatever, like you guys will write whatever you want in our course evals. And they, there's no sort of driving force for them to change their curriculum or change their um, teaching methodology, which is something that's you know frustrating on a student. And especially when I would say for the first year, you don't get a choice in the teachers and the professors that you get. You're placed into a class and you have to figure out what that professor system is and go with it and it's sort of on you to do that and so you know when you get to the end of the course a lot of the time i think it comes down to sort of you ranting about all of the injustices that you feel like you went through throughout the semester and not necessarily thinking that it's actually going to have any effect on the people who are going to come um, thank you all for all of your presentations one thing I was hearing across the board was just how important or how uh, 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 positive an experience it was for you to feel recognized, to feel like your voices mattered. So um, I'm coming as a, a French professor, so the opposite of, uh, I don't do lectures, I'm teaching a seminar that meets once a week, right? So for me, in terms of what format um, to, 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 to choose um, or what format would might might work in making students feel like their voices have been heard? I hesitate to devote one. The semester is not very long, right? It's only about twelve teachable weeks because the first week you can't really do anything shopping, and I hesitate to take class time out, of which I don't have that much of, to go over evaluations because that means we're leaving one less novel that semester. Um, so can you? think of alternatives to taking class time away to go over student feedback um, that might still make you feel uh, recognized and listened to. Yeah, I can. I, I think like students do read their emails and <laughs> do respond to office hours. Um, I think if there were like opportunities to go talk to you in office hours about feedback, that might also be an option. I don't necessarily think that it needs to be in lecture or in your seminar, because I do understand that seminars are very limited time, and what students value about seminars is the learning, not necessarily talking about the feedback of the learning. Um, so I think an email communication is also totally fine. I've had professors who have done that in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and we do read that, because obviously when your professor is sending you something, you should probably check what it is. Um, and maybe like, I, I don't know, like candid office hours may also be an option, like office hours themed around the feedback. I would second that particularly with office hours. I've had professors who, you know, after I ask a question, will ask, how do I feel about the class? How do I feel like it's going? And that sort of opens up the conversation. And, you know, they're definitely professors where I know to be sort of more, no, everything, you know, everything's fine, ultimately more, positive and there are other professors who I know are really looking for the more constructive criticism 
um, but having the opportunity and having a professor sort of prompt you to give that in a more one-on-one -on -one setting makes it feel like you're actually having your voice heard. So maybe a companion question to that, and I know a couple of you mentioned that you've also taught, and so you've been on the other side of this system of evaluations, and so, um, when you have you ever as a teacher or as a student um, have you been given a mid-course evaluation so from the student side where it really didn't ask something about something that you cared deeply about and did that you know how did that make you feel were you frustrated by that and then on the other uh, and as a student you know did you ever answer something on a mid-course and not see it addressed in the class and you know what did you feel about that and then from the sort of teacher side of things you know can you can you think about why that might happen that disconnect of you know that a, either you don't get asked something or that you don't um, have an opportunity to that you don't hear that your feedback was really addressed um, so I've been I don't we don't, we don't have mid-year for BCMP, right? We didn't do that? No, Jason, not. yeah, so uh, <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't have specific sort of, um, sort of a specific answer to the question of mid-year evaluations, but I've been both a student and a TA for the second year um, this, this time around uh, in, in the first year molecular biology graduate course uh, for my program. So I've, I've sort of seen the exact same course for, for three years now from both sides. and. There, I, I think something that the students sometimes, so when I was a student and hearing feedback from students in my section um, that, that I lead a discussion section every two weeks, um, is that sometimes students, students fail to um, really see the reality of, of running a course. And, and sometimes, uh, it, you know, just during informal, maybe halfway through the semester, I'll check in with people and see how see how my students are doing, they'll, they'll sort of um, bring up points um, such as, uh, say, changing the format of problem sets or, or changing the way things are graded or the weighting of the grades that really aren't um, things that can be changed in the middle of, uh, in the middle of a course. And, and while they might be valid points, I, I feel um, like sometimes a mid-course evaluation is going to solicit um, comments that are not necessarily helpful to that year of the course. Um, and it might be more helpful, um, and those mid-year comments are going to be more helpful, really, for kind of reminding students um, and collecting collecting their thoughts while their thoughts are still fresh on whatever was being sort of taught around that that mid-year period. And so, by the time you get to the final course evaluation, they haven't uh, sort of forgotten what they were experiencing. Can I can I maybe follow up on that? I think yeah. that was a great point. Uh, and a, a couple of the questions that you guys did a wonderful job uh, writing to spoke to when when is the most effective time to ask for feedback? And a couple of people suggested continuous, like should it be like a daily journal that every day I kind of like go home and say this class was awesome, or I would have changed this part, or uh, could it even be fun in that context? Could it is it always have to be an arduous? Uh, end of the year soul like soul searching thing, or can it be uh, maybe a more informal, continuous thing? And I just want to open that to you. Can I just add to that? Maybe maybe even after the course is over, allow some time to go by mm -hmm. so that you can really reflect <clears throat> on what are the lasting effects of that course. Mm -hmm. I've had students who have given a course fair evaluation at the very end, thought about it over the summer and come back and tell me it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Because the takeaway filtered through um, those, those moments, those high intensity moments that may have come from the class at a moment. So in fact, is that more valuable for you to reflect on after some time has passed? And as you're maybe making Choices for what the next, what are the next courses that I'm going to be taking? I, I think like I very much echo exactly what you said. I do think there's some like right now the Q scores are solicited right before students get their grades. Um, I do think there's some logistical difficulties in that 
once a student sees their grade, they may not feel the same way about the course. Um, but I do think that there are definitely courses that I have taken here, which after teaching subsequent courses, I feel so much more grateful for having to take. Like I took MCB 60 with Marty, um, and that course I am so grateful for having taken because the skills that I use are now invaluable in higher level graduate bio courses that I'm taking. Um, so I think that in and of itself is a useful tool to think about soliciting feedback maybe a semester after you've taken the class, after you've taken more advanced classes in the same area. Um, but that being said, that doesn't necessarily have to get rid of the Q scores being collected right before the grades. Because I do think that there is some value to a student reflecting on the course before getting something on their transcript that tells them how they did in the course. Actually, that reminds me of something that came up in the panel this morning, which was asking alumni for feedback. And so, Senia, I know you are you are a Harvard alumnus, and so um, are there, if you reflect back on your undergraduate experience, are there things that, are there courses that you took that, or, you know, information you've retained or skills you've retained from your undergraduate years that you now realize, like, oh, I didn't appreciate that that same way at the, when I was going through it as I do now. Definitely. Um, so actually, one of my classes right now tends to be more politically science focused, and I was a social studies um, undergrad major and had to take this class my sophomore year called Social Studies 10, which everybody knows is sort of a nightmare, and it's all social theory, um, and you just have to get through it to get to the good stuff. Um, and going through this class now, really makes me think back on, into undergrad and thinking, wow, you know, I wish I had paid more attention in social <laughs> studies 10. Uh, it was, and it was just a really good foundation for learning how to read texts and sort of pick up um, these ideas and the main messages from the authors, um, which I thought I knew how to do. And then afterwards I was like, no, actually now I know how to do this better. Um, and so looking back on it, there are definitely classes that stick out that I think I didn't appreciate at the time as much as I should have and now very much value having done. In the same vein, there are also classes that I thought were really interesting during undergrad and have sort of not really contributed much um, in terms of sort of my academic development. Um, but they were good all the same. They are really interesting, happy that I took them, but definitely maybe not as productive or effective for so that adds an interesting dimension to this alumni feedback piece, which is that's great for all faculty, right, to know what did my students retain years out, but also for student, prospective students in that class, right, to hear from an alumni who's in the law school saying, you might think this class is a drag, but you're going to really need it, so pay attention to this. Okay, I know we have a hard stop. Everything, you know, we, these, these were such rich stories that our plans for interaction sort of evaporated because I, I think we all felt like we really wanted to give uh, the students the voice in here. So we need to stop now, right? Yeah. <laughs>